Hi everybody, welcome back. In this video, we will learn how to calculate pH changes in a buffer solution. So in my previous videos, we have discussed a buffer needs a weak acid and its conjugate base, or alternatively, you can say weak base and its conjugate acid. And so the purpose of a buffer is to neutralize any added acid or base. Right? So if we look at the figure at the bottom here, when the acid is acid to when the acid is added to a buffer, a stoichiometric amount of weak base is converted to the conjugate acid. All right, and you can see that here after the addition of the acid. Now when you add base to the buffer, then a stoichiometric amount stoichiometric amount of the weak acid is converted to the conjugate base. And so initially, maybe we started with initial um, equal concentrations of the weak acid and conjugate base, but if you had acid, it's going to react with the base. And so you can see now we have unequal amounts in our buffer. And if you were to add base, then you'd have unequal amounts um, of the weak acid to conjugate base. So with that being said, the first calculation you have to do is stoichiometry. It's what you learned in first semester general chemistry. You need to calculate how the addition changes the relative amount of weak acid and conjugate base. Now I'm gonna call this the Ba table. And when you work with the Ba table, you must work in moles. Now then, once you've done your addition, you see what the relative amounts of weak acid and conjugate base you have, then you're gonna do an equilibrium calculation. And then this is when you use your rice table that we've used before. And with the rice table, you will work in molarity. So BA table, work in moles, rice table, work in molarity. Let's do an example problem together so you can see how the BA table works. And once again, it's just stoichiometry that you're doing, but since everything is one to one to one to one in your chemical reaction, um, that's where the BA table is kind of a fast and easy way to determine what's left over in your beaker after adding acid or base. So in this example here, we have a one liter beaver so buffer solution that contains 0 0.100 moles of acetic acid and 0 0.100 moles of sodium acetate. Let's calculate the pH after adding 0 0.0100 moles of solid sodium hydroxide. And we're gonna ignore any small changes in volume after the base is added. Okay, first thing is first is to identify what you're adding. We're adding sodium hydroxide, which is a what? Excellent, it's a strong base. And what part of the buffer does the sodium hydroxide want to react with? Does it wanna react with acetic acid or sodium acetate? Good, it's gonna to wanna to react with the acid. Remember, acids and bases react together. Two bases are not gonna to want to react with one another. So let's go ahead and write the equation that's taking place here. So we have the base that's added. I'm not gonna include sodium. That's just the spectator ion. I'm doing more the net ionic equation here. So the base is reacting with the acid component of my buffer. <clears throat> 
this reaction is not at equilibrium. It's going forward here. That's why I'm just using a single arrow. Because the base is a proton acceptor, it goes from hydroxide to H2O. And since acetic acid donated its proton, it turns to its conjugate base, acetate. It's really important that you feel confident in predicting what is going on in your beaker. So once again, talk yourself through this. You're saying, okay, I'm adding a base to my buffer. The base will only react with the acidic component in my buffer. This is a proton acceptor, this is a proton donor, and then predict the products um, from that reaction. Okay, like I said, we're working with the BA table. B stands for before addition. So before the addition, we had zero moles of hydroxide in solution. Remember with the auto ionization of water, it's pretty negligible. So we'll just assume zero. It looks like we put in our beaker 0.1 moles of acetic acid. We always kind of ignore water here. And then acetate also we put in before the addition of the base 0.1 moles. So that's our buffer here. And once again, just to reiterate, always work in moles since we're doing stoichiometry here. All right. The first A in our BA table stands for addition. Like what's happening during the addition? Well, we are adding 0 0.0100 moles of hydroxide. We know that when we add that, that's reacting immediately with acetic acid. So in this row here, I'm gonna subtract out 0 0.0100 moles with the understanding that the base that's being added is reacting with the acetic acid, and so that's why I'm subtracting out that many moles there to figure out what I'll have left over after the addition. And the BOD table, like I said, is useful because everything is one-to-one, -one, so we don't have to worry about multiple -mole ratios here. Um, we just have to worry about what's reacting and what's being produced. So as the acetic acid is being reacted or consumed, it's converted to its conjugate base like we saw in the figure before. So instead of subtracting out conjugate base, we're actually adding it because we're creating it as the reaction is taking place. So the second A in your BA table stands for after addition. So what do you have? Well, after the addition, remember the whole purpose of the buffer is to neutralize added base. And so if this is the limiting reactant, meaning that it was less moles than the other reactant, which is acetic acid, then this is completely consumed. You should have none of it left over. Now with the acetic acid, we have 0 0.090 moles left over after the addition of the base. And with the conjugate base, we have 0 0.110 moles. So if you've been watching my videos, you know my famous question here is always, what's in your beaker? So let's write that down. What's in my beaker when, right? Well, what's in my beaker, especially if the volume of the solution is one liter, if I take the moles and divide by one liter, what's left in my beaker is 0 0.090 molar acetic acid and 0 0.110 molar acetate, the conjugate base of acetic acid. Once again, I just took the moles, divided by the volume, the total volume here, and that's where I got this in molarity. Essentially, what we have in our beaker is still a buffer. It is a weak acid and its conjugate base. Now, I'm going to use the rice table method first. I've recorded two videos um, that show you how to 
solve for the pH of a buffer using a rice table and one with the Henderson Hasselbach. So I'm going to show you both in this video here in case you feel more comfortable with one method versus the other. So rice table method. Always write down your reaction. I usually use the acetic acid or the weak acid on the left side and do Ka rather than putting the weak base on the left side and doing Kb. You just get comfortable with one way. For me, it was always working with acids. <clears throat> and so therefore, the conjugate acid of water is the hydronium ion and the conjugate base is acetate of acetic acid. So initially now in our beaker, we have 0 0.090 molar acetic acid. That's why it was so important for us to do the BOD table first so we know what's left over after adding that strong base, sodium hydroxide. negligible amount of um, acid there, hydronium ion, and then the acetate is 0 0.110 molar that we start off with in our beaker. Then you just follow the method minus 1x for the reactants, plus 1x, plus 1x, and then at equilibrium, 0 0.090 minus 1x, so I'm just going to say minus x, 0 plus 1x is x, and 0 0.110 plus x here. We set this up to the Ka expression, products over reactants. And the Ka for acetic acid is 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. And so let me go ahead and move this over real quick to give us a little bit more space. Now X looks like it's going to be small enough to ignore considering that the initial concentration is about 5,000 times um, larger than the Ka. So I'm going to ignore X plus X minus X. <clears throat> and when I do that and solve for X, I get 1.47 times 10 to the negative fifth. If you were to divide that by 0 0.09 and then times 100%, X is about 0.016% of the initial concentration. It doesn't matter which initial concentration you use. That rule um, that X is small enough to ignore should follow for both of those concentrations. Um, and so if X is 1.47 times 10 to the negative fifth, that means the hydronium ion concentration is equal to 1.47 times 10 to the negative fifth, and pH is the negative log of the hydronium ion concentration, so therefore pH is equal to 4.83. And we've worked with, in a previous video, acetic acid and the acetate um, buffer before in equal amounts, and the pH of that buffer in pure water is about 4.74. So you can always ask yourself, does this make sense, right? When I add base, the pH goes up to 4.83. And yes, it does, because you're getting a little bit more basic, but the buffer's still doing its job. We're still maintaining of a pH of about 
you know, 4.8. We were at 4.74. It's inevitable that when you're adding the base in there, it's going to slightly increase the pH, but at least it didn't shoot up all the way to pH 12, for example, right? The buffer was doing its job in neutralizing the added base. Now, in the next video that I will post, I talk about buffering capacity and that, yeah, buffers are not always foolproof, right? If you add too much base, you're going to essentially break your buffer. Same goes for adding too much acid. But in this case here, the base that was added was still the limiting reactant. And so the acetic acid was able to neutralize that added base and you still had a buffer left over. All right, speaking of buffers, we've also learned that if X is small enough to ignore and you have a buffer in your beaker, you can use the henderson hasselbach and you can skip the rice table. So let's go ahead and plug this into the henderson hasselbach equation. Remember, henderson hasselbach is equal to the pKa. pKa is the negative log of the Ka, so I'm going to do that. Plus the log of the conjugate base. Let me make that look a little prettier. Log of the conjugate base over the acid, over that weak acid. So this is the henderson hasselbach and when you plug that into your calculator, you get 4.83. <clears throat> so you may ask, well, why are we going through the rice table method when the henderson hasselbach is so much shorter um, and so much easier. Well, like I've said before, and you will hear me say again, that the henderson hasselbach only works for buffers only. Later on, when I teach you titrations, we're gonna go through a very similar method. We're gonna have to do baud tables, right? And then we're gonna pause and we're gonna ask ourselves, what's in my beaker? And if what's in your beaker is a buffer, then by all means, please go and do that henderson hasselbach equation if you feel comfortable and X is small enough to ignore. However, when we're doing titrations, sometimes what's left in our beaker is just a weak acid. And if it's just a weak acid, then you need to do a rice table. So that's the reason why I teach both methods. And I find that a lot of students like to stick with a ba table followed by the rice table just so they don't fall into the trap of trying to use the henderson hasselbach for a weak acid only or for a weak base only and make that mistake. So that's why, you know, sometimes taking the longer route is actually can save you in the long run. But however, if you feel confident that yes, you have a buffer, it is generally safe to use the henderson hasselbach We're working with such weak acids um, and weak bases that X is, for these cases, for buffers and for titrations, X is usually small enough to ignore. All right, so thank you all for watching and I will see you next time.